Greetings and salutations gamers, my name is Kyle, also known as Gamers Weekend, and welcome back to the Dark Souls Challenge. We've been away for a while, journeying through the lands between of Elden Ring and completing challenges like Stamina Lists and Archery Only. But just like any trip, I was really starting to miss home, so I had to come back to my good old friend Dark Souls 1 to complete a new and unique spin on the game. Dark Souls Without Walking is definitely a weird challenge to define. It took me some time to decide exactly how I wanted this challenge to play out, and I eventually settled on a rule set that would make it simple to define without taking away from the difficulty of the challenge. That being said, let's get into the rules. First of all, throughout the duration of the entire game we are not allowed to move the left analog stick. Obviously this is where the term without walking comes from, but this will also rule out sprinting, dodge rolling, and redirecting our character mid-shot with a bow or mid-swing with a weapon. However, I will be allowing one exception to this rule. Ladders. Simply put, the game would be impossible by the fourth room of the asylum without this stipulation, and many other spots of the game would also become inaccessible, if not impossible to complete. Even with the use of glitches, some of these segments to my knowledge are still impossible to complete without the left analog stick. For the sake of interest, we'll allow the use of the left stick only for climbing ladders. On the topic of glitches, we'll be completely banning the use of them for the challenge as well. Stuff like death cam, soul duplication, and wrong warps are out of the question. The challenge begins upon the start of the game and ends upon claiming an ending in the kiln after defeating Gwyn. And of course, we'll be going after every boss in the game. Just for fun, I'm going to be adding one more bonus rule to the challenge. I will be restricting myself from using magic this run. Most of the challenges I've undertaken are very magic centric, so I figured it'd be particularly fun to take this on without ever touching a spell. Besides, the race to Darkbeed probably makes this a little less interesting, so we're going to go full on martial on this one. One last thing before we get started, I ask y'all time and time again to press the subscribe button, and you guys are super generous with following through on that. We finally hit the big 100k, and I couldn't be more thankful for all the love and support you've shown on this journey. Thank you guys so much for everything. That should be about it. I hope you are all having a wonderful day, and without further ado, this is the Dark Souls Remastered No Walking Challenge. This is a challenge I had a tricky time planning out. Unlike most challenges where I have a plan of action early and then have to adjust my strategies for later bosses, it's almost the opposite in this case. I know by the end game I can amass a lot of strength and brawl with the late game bosses without too much difficulty, but early game is going to be a massive problem. We have very few levels in stamina making it very difficult to move, and no matter what class we go with our health bar is going to be pretty small. Even trying to navigate areas, let alone trying to farm for souls or fight bosses, is going to be a massive pain. Without our ability to walk, we're gonna need a way to get around, which leaves us with two main options, attacking and backstepping. Both of these will be useful for different situations, besides just the obvious. Attacking lets us move forward, and backstepping lets us move backwards, but it gets much more complicated than that. Backstepping is the lesser known little brother of the dodges to the roll, and for good reason. Just like dodge rolling, it's affected by equipment load, but unlike dodge rolls, it doesn't have the large amount of invincibility frames. Interestingly enough though, it does have an unlimited amount of poise attached to it. At least, a seemingly unlimited amount of poise. Pretty much every attack in the game can be backstepped through without being staggered, which makes it an amazing tool in some areas and a lot of fights. However, we also need to be careful about using it for the super poise. Just like dodge rolls, you take increased damage when you are hit during a backstep, making it a dangerous option in some situations. On the other hand, attacking lets us travel a variety of distances based on what weapons we're using and what attacks. Most notably, the unarmed punches in our offhand lets us make very small and precise movements. This will be a massive help in navigating a few areas. Places like Anne Orlando Rafters come to mind. But attacking is also a pivotal form of movement when we're in combat. Seeing as when we're locked onto a target we'll always be facing the enemy, backstepping will always take us further away. Spoiler warning, that tends to make it harder to hit things. So sometimes we'll just have to attack in order to cover the distance. 
Speaking of what direction we're facing, if we don't have an enemy to lock onto, we don't really have much of a way to change direction. And trust me, you don't realize how powerful being able to move left and right is until you've had that taken away from you. Thankfully, we don't have to go too far to find a solution. If we're able to enter zoomed mode or first person in a half mode, shoulder view. When we enter shoulder view, we rotate the character by looking around. The unfortunate side effect of this is that movement in this challenge is incredibly dizzying and resulted in a number of major headaches, mainly because a lot of the movement looks like this. Horrible, isn't it? That's about all the basics for the run. Now to put it into practice, which is its own headache. And I do mean that both figuratively and literally. Starting out the run, we have two options, the Thief and the Hunter class. Picking the Hunter will give us a slightly easier asylum, and getting an early bow will make some of the very early areas a bit easier to traverse in a few ways. However, we're going to pick the Thief class since it gives us an automatic master key. This is particularly useful since we have no ability to turn in the asylum without a way to enter shoulder mode unless we take the binoculars as a starting gift. The asylum will be a bit trickier to get through, and the binoculars are unbearably slow compared to a bow, but having the master key will let us be much more flexible once we arrive in Lordran. Using the binoculars, we slowly make our way to the first bonfire, and then make six direct strikes into the asylum demon's room, just far enough to not trigger the fight. We then make our way to the door and around the falling ball to grab our sippy cup. Once we have slowly backed our dump truck back up the stairs and clear the enemies, we make sure to enter the Asylum Demon's room from the right side. At this angle, we can strong attack off the ledge giving ourselves enough momentum to land a plunging attack. From there the plan is fairly simple. We want the demon to back us into the wall where we can get stuck under him, which in turn will render half of his attacks nearly useless. However, whenever he jumps away from us, does his flying slam, or plunges straight down with his hammer, it can cause us issues. Thankfully, we get fairly good RNG and clean him up on our first attempt. While we make our way to Firelink, we- What in the world are you doing? Oh god, please stop, we're failing the chat. I make my way around Firelink, grabbing most of the small souls and other items around the area, and start slowly making my way to the Undead Bird Bonfire. I'm making sure to clear out all the enemies for now, because not only will it be difficult to get around if they're constantly bothering us, but souls are a very valuable commodity right now. With movement taking a massive amount of time and energy early on, farming just about anything is going to be a huge hassle. We're going to need to improvise a bit here. We make our way down to the Undead Merchant and pick up a short bow so we can stop using the binoculars and a bunch of wooden arrows. After dark signing back to the bonfire, it's time to start our first grind. I have a small grocery list of supplies and levels I want, so we're going to get started early on our farming. From the Undead Berg bonfire, we have a view of a crossbow wielding soldier. With the right angle, we can take him out using 3-4 to four wooden arrows and then immediately sit down if he doesn't drop anything. This farming technique is actually useful to us in a number of ways. Whenever we kill the Hollow, he drops 80 souls, and with each wooden arrow costing 3 souls apiece, that means we profit about 70 souls every kill. Additionally, since he counts as a Hollow enemy, he has a small chance to drop a soft humanity every time we kill him. I imagine we'll be drinking a lot of Estus this run, so humanity for kindling might become a scarce resource. But best of all, Hollow soldiers have a chance to drop Titanite shards. These little guys are sold for 800 souls apiece, and we're going to be using a lot of them in this run. Getting as many as we can early on will help us out a lot. Unfortunately, Titanite Shards went a little dry for us, which is a bit unfortunate, but we did manage to get enough souls to stock up on arrows and firebombs, which will be great for picking off enemies at a range while we attempt to navigate around. Once we have a few levels and some supplies under our belt, we could go for Taurus Demon, or we could try to get past Havel and into Dark Root. If we get into Dark Root, we could make it to Andre and stock up on upgrades as well as grabbing a Firekeeper Soul from the Parish Church. I think prioritizing upgrades is going to be the best bet for most of this run, so we're going to try for that first. Although that's easier said than done. Given with our current movement, it's a near 20 minute journey full of Hollow Warriors chucking firebombs, Hollow Soldiers, a Crossbow Hollow, Havel the Freaking Rock, Blue Crystal Golems, and Dark Root Foliage. Needless to say, the journey up there was, uh...
not an easy one. Eventually, we made our way to Darkroot Basin, killing a Black Knight and grabbing a longbow along the way, and then head around the Titanite Demon to get to Andre. After restocking on arrows and upgrading our longbow to plus two, we go ahead and take out said Titanite Demon using a few different safe spots. Afterwards, we backtracked back into the basin quickly to get our hands on the Grass Crest Shield. The extra stamina regeneration is always nice, and this time around we need to expend stamina just to move. It's going to give us far more value this challenge than in any other challenge we've encountered. Our next goal was to pick off the Heavy Knight in the Parish Church. The main strategy was to just kite him backwards along the path to Andre, staying just outside of his range, and pepper him with arrows. After claiming our Firekeeper Soul, we were also able to quickly pick off the Channeler and make our way back down to Firelink. Right now we're prioritizing levels in Endurance, Health, and Strength. I've got an idea for a weapon, but we're several levels away from it for now. We'll get to that later. In the meantime, we get our Estus Flask to plus one. We've got a few more levels under our belt, some firebombs to our name, and some upgrades to the bow. I think we're ready to give Taurus Demon a shot, so we go ahead and slowly make our way back to his bridge. The strategy here is much like the knight from the church, using back steps to stay just outside of his range and pelt him with attacks as we back up. The difference is we're in danger of running out of space behind us, so we start off the fight by getting a decent distance into his side to give us as much room as possible. Thankfully, we're able to make the strategy work with little complications. That's the Taurus Demon down on the first try. I'm starting to think ahead while flashing back at the same time. I know eventually I'm gonna need to start grabbing upgrades, and unless we win the Dark Wraith lottery, we're going to need a Titanite slab. The problem is the only reliable slab we can get early is the Asylum Revisit. If anybody remembers our Staminalist Challenge, you may remember getting back to the Asylum is a big question mark without movement options. In our particular case, backstepping across this gap seems like it's either going to be extremely precise or just straight up impossible. I try out a couple different methods to try and get across, and nothing seems to be working at the moment. This is something I'll be keeping in mind for now and come back to later when we're ready to head back. In the meantime, the big scary Helkai Dragon is going to be a pain to get past, so we're going to get around the situation by going around. Particularly through the gates of the church, grabbing the key to the lower burg along the way, and past the giant boar and under the bridge. While we're here, it would be nice to have a reliable placeholder for a weapon. Seeing as how we have a bow and we're under the bridge, I think it's time we break out a strategy I haven't touched in years. By shooting the dragon's tail off from under the bridge, we can claim the Drake Sword, an actually fairly unimpressive weapon for most of the game, but for the Undead Burg and Parish areas, its base damage is massive. This thing is going to be a lot of help for these first few areas while we're still building up to use our weapons of choice. Next we'll make our way up to the parish church. We can clear out the room full of pink hollows by hitting one with an arrow, causing half of them to group up in the stairwell and the other half to drop down to us. Then we can use the Drake Sword or Firebombs to clear them out, and we head over to Lord Trek's cell to let him out. A quick trip back to Firelink lets us knock him over using the Drake Sword special attack. I guess the man knows his place. I'll be taking that, thank you. We go ahead and scale back up the parish church and into the Belfry Gargoyles. My initial goal heading into this fight was to burst down the first gargoyle with the Drake Sword, and then either fight off the second one with range or bait him in to finish him off with the Drake Sword as well. The first gargoyle seemed to have other plans, and made it fairly tricky to land multiple hits. The second gargoyle came out and the fight got pretty spotty at best, but I needed to get out of this scenario as quickly as possible. I went ahead and kept focus on the first gargoyle, and eventually got him down. From there, the second gargoyle wasn't much of an issue. Once again, we defeat the boss on the first attempt. The first of two bells is down, and things aren't necessarily getting easier. We're able to get our longbow up to plus five, but the further we get into the game, the more desperately we're going to need a reliable weapon. So let's go ahead and get ahead of the curve. The main resource we're lacking at the moment is souls, and we're gonna need a lot of them first part on our upgrade path is to take on the Moonlight Butterfly. Thankfully, the process for this boss isn't too complicated. Shield and attack, throw a firebomb, repeat. 
Not much to see here other than a first try victory. Taking down the Moonlight Butterfly nets us a large amount of souls in the Divine Ember. The Ember we'll put to use in a bit, so put a pin in that one. On the other hand, with about 14k souls to our name, we're fairly close to the crest of Artorius, so we'll farm the stone soldiers and bushes for the rest of the souls to cover the cost. Once we're able to access the Forest Hunters segment of Darkroot, we have a fairly reliable way to farm for souls for a bit. By baiting a Forest Hunter over the stairs, we can cause them to drop themselves off the nearby cliff. Since we aren't able to move much, this is a little tricky to get used to at first, and the mage can be difficult at times but it's actually pretty fast for what we need and we gain 2,000 souls per run. Definitely worth the effort. After getting a few levels in Vitality and Endurance and taking the time to bolster our strength up to 22, we make sure to grab the Stone Armor before heading back to Andre. We're going to stock up on arrows because the next bell and part of our soul problem could be knocked out at the same time. We slowly make our way down the new Londo elevator, into the Valley of Drakes, and slowly descend through Blighttown and into Quelag's domain. We're here to take on the Spider Lady herself. For bow only, we manage to rack up a lot of damage by keeping Quelag momentarily stunlocked by hitting her human body with arrows. This is because every time Quelag's human body is hit, it stuns her. However, in that challenge, she managed to get out of it a few times, so we'll have to be careful here. This time around we put on the stone armor just in case things go sour, but it turns out there was no need. We keep Quelag locked out of ever getting an attack off, and take down the spider without ever taking a single hit. Not only is that 20,000 souls to our name, but bell number 2 as well. The souls Quelag gave us were just enough to get what we needed. 24 strength is in the bag, and just a game of reverse violent hopscotch later, we claim the weapon of the run, the Zweihander. I chose the Zweihander this run specifically because of its high damage as well as its moveset. The strong attacks have a decent amount of movement tied to them, and that could be useful in some situations. We have enough to beef it up to plus 5, but we're going to need the large ember to get it any higher. That means we need to get into the depths, and in order to do that, we need to cross off the Capra Demon. Thankfully, while we're wearing literal slabs of rock, the enemies in Lower Berg don't put up much of a fight, and then it's time to take on the Goat. Not being able to move against the Capra Demon might sound frightening, but Stone Armor is easily this boss's greatest fear. The one who should have been running away was him. Yet another first try in the books. After Perry slapping a butcher around and claiming our ember, I went ahead and tried out Gaping Dragon. But long story short, we just don't have the stamina to pull this one off quite yet. We'll come back to this. Now that we have the large ember, we can start taking weapons up to plus 10, but to do so we're gonna need some large titanite shards. We could pick some up throughout Sen's fortress, but there aren't enough in order to fully upgrade. Not only that, but the merchant who sells large titanite shards is across a gap that we would have to jump across. And speaking of that gap, you know what else is over there? The key to the elevator shortcut. So first we'll have to get through Sen's fortress without walking, which is already a frightening concept on its own and it'll end up being either a one-way trip or a very painful climb back down. At least until we can get through Iron Golem and Ornstein and Smo. Case in point, before we climb all the way up that fortress, I want to make sure we're fully prepared to take on what's ahead of us before we start going forward. That means we're going to need a new avenue to get upgrades. The first part of our new plan is a quick trip back into Darkroot Basin in order to kill the Halberd Black Knight. I'm actually not here for the Halberd, but instead the blue Titanite Chunk. We can take this back to Kingseeker Fram, who will break it down into three green Titanite Shards. Andre can use these to make us a Divine Battle Axe. With our Divine Battle Axe in hand, it's time to plunge into the Catacombs. I chose this weapon specifically because it's pretty easy to stunlock the Skeletons with it, and taking them out will make life much easier. Traversing the entirety of the Catacombs without functioning legs doesn't sound like an experience I'll gain sanity on. 
so I figured I'll give the catacombs drop a try. It's a simple trick where you drop off at the first bridge almost all the way down to the bottom, and then you simply head to the Paladin Leroy ledge and into Pinwheel. The setup for the trick actually wasn't too bad, and with timing our drop with the exploding skulls we pretty easily navigated down to the Bonewheel Valley. When it came to the bone wheels, we only managed to attract one of them, and being patient with our back steps made it so we could dodge them all the way to the boss door. All that was left was to take on Pinwheel. So Pinwheel is usually hilariously easy, but that's for normal functioning human beings that can chase him down and hit him. It's about the same idea and concept for us, but since we're so slow, we're much more susceptible to his fireballs. There were some fairly scary segments, but nevertheless we were still able to take him out on our first try. With the right of kindling in hand, we'll be able to take bonfires up to 20 Estus. I'm going to assume that it's going to be pretty necessary for some of these later areas. We're almost set up to start tackling the rest of the game. Now we're just missing Firekeeper Souls and Upgrade Materials. We're going to have to improvise how we get our large shards, but I've already got an idea. We take the elevator down to the New Londo Runes and grab our Transient Curse. The Drake Sword Special Attack lets us easily clear out the ghosts on the way to the Firekeeper Soul, and we begin making our way through the Haunted H2O. There were a few spots that gave me a little bit of trouble, but it only took me one or two attempts to clear most of the areas. As per usual, we sniped Ingward off the top of the ghost house to avoid having to go through the horde of ghosts and obtained the key to the seal. Before we head down though, let's bolster those drop rates. We make a quick trip into Sen's ball pit of horrors and patiently make our way through the pendulums and into the boulder trap. Backstep Superpoise lets us backstep straight through the boulders without getting staggered, but we need to watch our health. We slowly make our way down to the boulder pit and collect the golden covetous serpent's ring. A quick trip back to Firelink and we're ready to start farming. Most notably the Dark Wraiths, which are well known for their drop table of the Dark Hand, Titanite Chunks, and the super rare Titanite Slab. If we are lucky enough to get a slab it would be a huge help, but ultimately we're going after the Titanite Chunks. Not only will they take us from plus 10 to plus 14, but we can also take them to Fram to will break them down into 3 large Titanite Shards apiece. That'll help us upgrade from plus 6 all the way to plus 10. We open the seal and unwet the place and begin farming the Dark Wraiths. Which is totally easier said than done without walking, by the way. Every time we head back to the runes, it's a nearly 4 minute trip just to get back to the Dark Wraiths, and they aren't exactly easy to kill. My main method for dealing with them is to hit them with an arrow, then double strong attack with the two-handed Zweihander. It's pretty consistent, but the Dark Wraiths are fairly slippery and can still kill us regardless. After grabbing our very large ember, we spend roughly an hour grinding up most of the Titanite chunks we need, and for the last Titanite chunk we go ahead and pay a visit to the Black Knight with a Greatsword in Undead Parish. Once we have enough chunks to make the large Titanite shards and upgrade to plus 14, we go ahead and take it up to the precipice of fully upgraded. As I've been farming, I've been thinking more and more on that ledge to get to the asylum. I've come up with an idea or two on how to get across, but they sound kind of crazy in my head. Before we give it a try though, this Y-hander is heavy. Let's go pay the old rock a visit and ask politely for his ring. How generous of you, Mr. Rock. Now back at Firelink Shrine, we make one more elevator ride back up to the ledge. We line ourselves up and go for the strong attack with our bare main hand. And to my utter surprise, it actually worked. This was a massive win for the run. With the ability to get into the asylum, we'll be able to take on the stray demon. And once he's down, we can claim a titanite slab and start powering through the game. All that's left is to... Oh no. My thoughts going into this boss that I was going to be able to full tank his attack with stone armor and then just trade back and forth with Zweihander until the boss melted. Turns out, even in full tank gear this guy is a menace. 
His attacks hit hard, we don't have nearly enough time to heal and retaliate, and he's always either moving or knocking us around too much for us to get a good opportunity in. Little did I know returning to this asylum that I'd be encountering one of the two most difficult fights of the run, probably even the most difficult. At least with a lighter setup, I can get iframes from him knocking me around, but that only makes some of the attacks much deadlier. Not being able to maneuver like I would any other stray demon fight has made this so much more difficult than I ever thought. Up against the wall, I knew that this wasn't going to be easy. There was only one way to get around this nightmare, and that was some good old fashioned get good. Opening the fight by trying to get as close to the stray demon as possible, every time I know I'm going to be hit by an explosion, I'm going to be sure to backstep the tank through it. Depending on the attack, most of the time I can squeeze right under the demon and get behind it. From there, I try to spam out the usual RNG loop where he does the straight down explosion. If he flies or turns around, I need to quickly reposition with a bow and make my way to his side. Hopefully, I can get him locked back into the explosion loop again. But if not, I continue to move around him by repositioning with the bow until I can get him back into the loop. It's almost like I'm treating this boss as a dodge and DPS phase. It's a very focused and intense fight where every little detail mattered, but over an hour later, we find the run. The stray is slain, and we claim the Titanite slab. After a quick trip back to Blighttown to grab one more Firekeeper soul, I decide that I'm going to upgrade my bow. So one more trip back into the new Londo ruins to grab the composite bow, followed by another hour and a half of farming Titanite chunks, and we've obtained a plus 14 composite bow. This should be a big help when clearing out areas. I think we've just about collected everything we need to well, take on pretty much the rest of the game to be honest. Some of the areas still concern me, but I think at this point, bosses should be easy enough to deal with. Let's go for a test run on Gaping Dragon. Composite Bow does a lot of damage, and while we do have to be careful about getting hit by some attacks, most of the Gaping Dragon's moveset isn't too threatening. As long as we stay out of the way of the charge, then we should be in the clear. Gaping Dragon goes down. Sense Sadistic Daycare was a place I was a little concerned about. My concerns are mainly with the Pendulums, but knowing that their flat side isn't dangerous makes it a lot easier to navigate through without issues. For Iron Golem, it didn't take too long to knock him over, and from there it was just cleanup. Oddly enough, that's the second boss done hitless without walking. An Orlando was one of those areas I was definitely concerned about. Rafters had me nervous since we're stuck traveling fixed distances, but didn't encounter too many issues. The Archers, on the other hand, much different story. I meant to bring poison arrows with me so I could let them slowly wither away, but since I forgot to bring them and I'm already all the way here, guess we're doing this the hard way. I had to make sure I was near the center of the path because otherwise we had a hard time getting up on the ledge. Being at the ready with quit outs in case we got knocked off was important too, but we had to be fast fingered when we got back in as well. Eventually we were able to get close enough to a silver knight in order to get a parry. Then we just had to... It's okay, it's fine, we saved it. Literally not even close, nothing to see here, moving on. The Un Orlando Keep wasn't too interesting, just a lot of Silver Knight parries. Finally, we were on to the Super Londo Super Show Duo. For the first phase, I full tanked up, healed when I needed to, and Iron Tarkist until Ornstein went down. For Super Smooth Who the Wonder Cat, I had this idea where I was going to kite him around the pillars with Composite Bow, but it turns out I was just overthinking things. Why think when I have a giant sword? I'm already fluent in the language of smack, so keep it simple, stupid. ONS go down on the second try. After we claimed our oversized soup bowl, we went ahead and placed it to open up the rest of the game. Time to make some soul soup. Tomb of the Giants was a bit tricky to navigate, primarily the first segment with the skeletal dogs, but once we get through them, we don't experience too many issues on the way to Nito. Dropping down into Nito's fight, we use our Divine Battle Axe to clear out the skeletons and then begin to employ the ultimate strategy of the run. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to We Stood There and Hit Them with a Giant Sword.
Once Nito was down, we moved on to Sif the Danger Doggo. We stood there, and we hit them with a giant sword. After that, we made our way to the Four Kings. We stood there, on the nothingness of the abyss, and hit them with a giant sword. The Duke's archives were a bit annoying to navigate, especially because of the Crystal Hollow Archers and their tons of fun and damage, but with enough humanity and Estus to heal, we took our time and grinded through the area. Composite Bow put in a lot of work here. The Crystal Caves were slightly less annoying, with our only concern being knocked off of invisible pathways, and we made our way to Seif the Scaleless. I made sure to pop some extra humanity before the fight began to build up Curse Resistance first, and then started the fight by shooting his crystal. While he was stunned, we started to get to work on his health. This fight wasn't very different from a typical Seath fight, just a lot more backstepping involved instead of walking. There were a few close calls where we almost got cursed, but nevertheless, we took the dragon down on our first try. Heading down to the basin, we went ahead and took out the Hydra, I'll let you guess what the main strategy employed was, and opened up the DLC. Before we head in though, we have a few more bosses we can cross off the list. First stop is to betray the four skank squad so we can claim the dark wood grain ring. This thing replaces any light rolls or back steps with a handspring, or as the community likes to call them, flips. The nice thing about the backflip is that it adds invincibility frames to our back step. We won't be needing to use it for a while, but we'll go ahead and keep it on hand for now. Next is to slay the illusion of inordinate debauchery and then make our way to the dragon slayer great bow. We can quickly convince the giant blacksmith to upgrade it to plus 5, and not so quickly convince him to let us have the hawk ring before we head down to Gwendolyn. Seeing as they're going to continuously teleport away from us, and I can imagine the chase is probably going to be hell, time to employ a different strategy. We stood there, and hit them with giant arrows. Yeah, it turns out that Gwendolyn doesn't really activate until you get to a certain distance into their room. If you stand just outside of that distance with a great bow and the hawk ring, you kind of just win. I'd feel bad for such a cheesy victory, but considering how long it took to get here, I feel zero remorse for this. Our next stop is the painted world of Ariamis, and Composite Bow did a lot of work getting through the area. Eventually, we made it to the sad pair of legs who was having trouble standing up, so we gave it a hand. Yeah, I have no idea why that works, by the way. I choose not to question it. For Priscilla, the invisibility may have posed a decent risk, but seeing as she has to come to us, we went ahead and stood there and hit her with a giant sword. Eventually she showed back up, and we continued to do the same thing, except this time we looked where we were swinging. We have one more area to take care of, but if I'm being honest, there's a certain part of Izalith that terrifies me this run. I'm going to push it off as much as I possibly can. which means it's time to head into the DLC land. First up is Sanctuary Guardian. This boss could have the potential to do a lot of damage if it decided to sit out of range and spam lightning, but we have the composite bow for range, and every time it gets close, well, we know how that story ends. Guardian goes down on the first try. The Royal Woods were an experience I'd rather not relive, complete with being slowly chased by stone soldiers who were very angry that I was appropriating their fine style and pitchforks, but after a few attempts we made it through in one piece. Once we arrived at Chester we were finally able to buy some green herbs to help catch our breath, and then it was time for Artorius. He too is fluent in the language of Giant Sword, but also has the ability to buff. However, we can easily headshot him out of the buff with our composite bow and get right back to our dialogue. Respect. The Abyss Walker goes down on the first try.
The township was slow to navigate, but by slowly picking off the enemies with the composite bow, we were eventually able to head down to the chasm. This place was also a little tricky to navigate through, particularly the section with the mage and humanity spirits, but once the mage was down, we were able to make our way down to the father of the abyss, Manus. Oh god, he's walking into the cutscene again. Somebody please stop it. Oh. Thanks, buddy. This fight can seem scary. The magic is terrifying to think about, and getting locked into his combo makes it sound like standing there would be an issue. That being said, standing there and hitting him with a giant sword is far more effective than you might think. Eventually, he jumps away from us, but that's exactly what the composite bow is here for. In a surprisingly easy battle, Manus goes down on the first try. After studying up a bit more with Goff on standing there and shooting with a giant bow, we went ahead and made our way down to Calamite. Calamite I expected to have issues with. A lot of issues. But aside from being blinded a few times by the Black Flames, he actually didn't put up much of a fight. In a surprising turn of events, we stood there and we hit him with a giant sword. And with that, we have taken out every DLC boss on the first try. The Isolith Gauntlet without walking is scary in more than a few ways. Ideally, I'd like to take out Ceaseless Discharge by escorting him over to the cliff, but I don't know how easily we're going to make it back to the door in this state. Fire Sage Demon is a scarier version of a fight we've previously struggled against, and Centipede Demon's Arena is a lava filled nightmare. But at the end of it all, we have the Bed of Chaos, a boss I've been avoiding as long as possible, because making the final run down to the core without walking sounds about as enjoyable as swimming with hungry alligators. But once we clear this area, I have no doubt that we'll be able to power through Gwyn and end the challenge. This is all that's left standing between us and completing all of Dark Souls without walking. Let's get to it. Ceaseless Discharge is up. We preemptively eat a green herb and start escorting him to the door. It's going to take us about two minutes to get him over there, but we brought plenty of Estus. As long as we keep drinking off the hits, we should be fine. It takes a couple of minutes, but eventually we get Ceaseless over to the door. Once he's on the cliff, it's all over. Discharge goes down on the first try. Demon Fire Sage could end up being Stray Demon, but worse, but we've had a lot of bosses between the two. We've gotten a lot stronger since then, so we're going to go for the tank strat before going through another backstepping nightmare. And while he was more difficult than a number of other bosses we tanked through, he wasn't able to break us. We managed to clear the Demon Fire Sage on, once again, the first try. From memory, I recall that Centipede Demon could be glitched out by luring him into the corner by the door. So I figured the best strategy was to do something similar, just less... glitchy. Just stand and wait for him at the door to slowly make his way over and then let him have it. Turns out, it was surprisingly effective. Stand there and hit him with a giant sword strikes again on the first try. All that was left was one final nightmare, the Bed of Chaos. The first part of this boss is easy enough. Slowly backstep our way to the right side first and take out the orb. Then we can quit out and slide back down to deal with the left. We'll stay along the back wall and snipe the orb from out of danger. Simple enough. It's the last approach that makes this a scary encounter. Having to deal with the swiping arms while only being able to backstep is not going to be fun. But to make matters worse, even if we get over to the final branch into the tunnel, we're still not in the clear. Backstepping doesn't break the branches on the way down, so it's going to be a long process of working our way down. Not to mention that each time we die, we have to work our way back to the boss fight, a nearly five minute trek in this challenge. Each failure is going to punish us with a long backstepping marathon of shame. To actually approach the center, this is where the Darkwood Grain Ring is going to come into play. The invincibility frames on our backstep are going to be a huge help here, but we have to be very careful about the angle, being even slightly off and we're going into the death plane. But finally, we found a run where we were successfully able to get away from the hands, up onto the centerpiece, and into the center. Using our starting bandit's knife, we manage to slowly chop our way down to the center and finish it off. The bed of chaos goes down.
With the Bed of Chaos defeated, there's only one area left to go through. We deposit our Lord Souls and begin our victory lap across the Kiln of the First Flame. Parrying each and every night, all the way down until it was time to take on the Lord of Cinder himself. He tried his best to throw us off and quite literally backed us into a corner, but in the end, what could he do but stand there and get hit by a giant sword? Gwyn goes down on the first try. And with that, we have completed all of Dark Souls Remastered without walking. Just for the record, that was awful. Thinking about the challenge and putting it together was a lot of fun, and some of the early aspects of the run were quite fun to play out. This challenge was on a fine line between a skill challenge and a puzzle challenge. Everything from a challenge perspective for this run was actually a lot of fun. That being said, the constant zoom in and zoom out of having to reposition every little detail was very sickening, and I don't even get motion sick. I had to take this challenge in doses because of the headaches I would get from this challenge. Eventually I got used to it, about when we arrived in Anor Londo, but this was a rough challenge to play. But, finally time to put another challenge in the books. I'm not entirely sure what Dark Souls challenge I want to work on next, but it will probably be pretty soon since Elden Ring Armor of Thorns is, uh... Yikes. If any of you have a suggestion for a challenge, feel free to leave it in the comments below or in the suggestions channel of my Discord. I've been combing through some of the suggestions I have written down, and some of these look like fun to take on, so keep them coming. But that's going to do it for me today. If you enjoyed the video, then please give it a thumbs up, bop that subscribe button, and ring a tingling that little bell to be notified whenever I drop another video. You can also join the Discord, link is in the description below to come chat and hang out with me and the rest of the community. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you gamers on the flip side. Later!